or a supernova. There's no question there's an awful lot of stars out there. The Bible says God made the stars. And the argument, Dr. Paulson, I agree, I, I don't think that a person who believes in evolution doesn't believe in God. I'll just say you don't believe in the same God that I believe in. The God that I believe in can make it right first time. He doesn't need to practice or play around. Okay? I wouldn't worship a God as retarded as one that has to use blind random chance to get us here. I think he did it right first time. Okay. Uh, I think all we see from stars is the opposite of evolution. Examples of things breaking or falling down, as far as how we see the distance to the stars, that was brought up earlier. That's one of the 14 points I have left hanging here. I cover that very thoroughly on video number seven, calculating the distance to stars. Uh, the idea that starlight is consistently the same speed, or that light is, a, they need to read what was done at Harvard two months ago in February. Uh, they slowed light down to one mile per hour in the laboratory. Um, last year they had slowed down to 38 miles an hour. Check uh, Dr. Howe, H-A-U, at Harvard University where they've done all this. But I go through calculating distance to stars. Everything I see from the stars proves the second law of thermodynamics. They're breaking down. They're burning out. They're falling apart. If red giant stars turn into white dwarf stars, that's the opposite of evolution. That's losing, not gaining. I'd like to see one example of any star forming or one example of any star improving in its complexity. I mean, obviously, they're burning up. I mean, it, where did they, how, how did they start is the question. That's all. And there's no evidence that they could have. All the evidence says they had to be created instantly, or had to be created at least, because they're all burning out. So how did it start is the obvious unanswered question from the evolutionist perspective. The question, the question I believe was about evolution of stars. I didn't say anything in my presentation about uh, anything except biological evolution, but among astronomers, there is a very well-developed theory of star evolution. We can't see stars evolve because it takes time, but we can infer uh, things and we can make tests of hypotheses just like we can do with biological evolution. I want to make a comment about one thing that Dr. Hoven said. He said he didn't believe in a God that relied on chance to get us here. I don't see anything wrong with chance. When parents have a child, they leave it up to chance what that child is going to be like. And yet they love that child just as much as if they had planned it, maybe more. Why can't it be the same with God? To create the universe at the beginning and let us come into being. He didn't create us specifically but we are in existence by his will. So I don't think you can argue against chance. And in fact, any other argument is going to lead you to determinism. If you think that you are here entirely by, it was determined that you're going to be here, then it couldn't be that you have any free will. If you don't have any free will, then morality, Love, faith, none of those things mean anything. The chance aspect is important. God had to give us freedom to make choices in order to make life meaningful. That's all. Um, starting with Dr. Paulson, a question is, are there any examples of non-life evolving into life? I, did you say non-life developing into life? Okay. Uh, I think the answer is no, but the... Um, <laughs> I'm assuming you mean the answer, I'm assuming you mean in the laboratory. Um, but the hypothesis that life originated, I, I didn't talk about this because I believe it's a separate issue and it, it complicates things because the hypothesis that living things came into existence uh, from non-living matter by natural means uh, is obviously much less well developed than the theory of change of species that I talked about. But still, the hypothesis that living things came into being from non-living matter can be tested. It, ha it makes predictions that can be tested. And it's, it's certainly not proven 
it's not even well established, but it has made some predictions that were quite surprising, which have turned out to be true and quite useful. For example, that hypothesis predicted the existence of, it would take too long to explain why, but it predicted the existence of molecules that have both the properties of genes and catalysts. In other words, it predicted that RNA molecules would serve as catalysts, uh, and that was subsequently found to be the case. It makes other predictions as well uh, about the existence of self-replicating molecules, uh, and there's been some progress along those lines. So it's not uh, an unreasonable hypothesis by any means. It certainly has not been disproven. I think it has been disproven as far as the origin of life. There have been numerous experiments to try to create life in the laboratory. Students are taught, like this textbook says, many important events occurred during the Archean era, the most important of which was the evolution of life. Progress from complex molecules to even the simplest living organism was a very long process. This one says, the first living cells emerged between 4 billion and 3.8 billion years ago. There is no record of the event. The first self-replicating systems must have emerged in this organic soup. What they did in the laboratory, Miller and Urey and many people since then have tried to make life in the laboratory by circulating methane, ammonia, water vapor, and hydrogen through some tubes with a lightning spark in there to simulate lightning in the early atmosphere. This is all fictitious, but this is what they think, okay? This textbook tells the kids, he made a mixture that was rich in amino acids. Talk about propaganda. <laughs> That's propaganda at its best. He didn't make life, he didn't even come close. He excluded oxygen from his experiment because he knew the presence of oxygen would break down any amino acids. It would be oxidized, so they purposely excluded oxygen. The problem with that is, if you don't have oxygen, you don't have ozone, and ozone blocks UV light, and UV light destroys ammonia. And that was one of his gases. So life cannot evolve without oxygen to protect the ammonia. The other problem is, the Earth has always had oxygen. The lowest rocks in the layer prove that. And he filtered out the product in his experiment. That's not realistic for us, what would happen in nature. What he made was 85% tar, 13% carboxylic acid. Both are toxic to life. You make a mixture that's 98% deadly to what you're trying to produce, I don't think you could call that a success. He produced basically two of the amino acids. It takes 20. The amino acids bond quickly with tar and acid. They will not bond with each other as fast as they will with the tar and acid. If we had an hour, we'd go through all this. He did not make life in the laboratory. What he made was a problem because they proved that it can't be done. Amino acids will unbond in water much faster than they bond, and the oceans are completely full of water all the way to the top. <laughs> and Brownian, Brownian motion is going to drive them away from each other. It's, it's not going to put them together. He Thank did you. not make life in the laboratory. They've never even come close. All the experiments Thank have you. shown us that there must have been a designer, an origin of this. This question again for you, Doctor. We'll start with you, Dr. Hoven. You kept talking about kind. What about the chosen, uh, excuse me, the closer similarities of a dolphin and a shark that you see by stepping back 30 feet when in fact the DNA and protein evidence shows that the dolphin and mouse are more similar. How can you explain this? I would explain the dolphin and mouse similarity. First of all, if a person says the dolphin and mouse are more similar in their DNA, I would like to ask exactly what are you examining? Because if you look at cytochrome C, you'll find that the human's closest, answer, closest relative is a sunflower. If you look at the eyes, our closest ancestor is an octopus. It depends on who's doing the examining and what you're trying to compare and, what, and also what point you're trying to prove. I think that the mouse and the dolphin are both mammals. They both breathe air above water, so that's a similarity. Uh, that's a common sense that a designer would do that. As far as the DNA sequencing proving anything, if I had time, if I'd give me